Okay. Um, well, I'll kick straight off with this. It takes about 30 minutes. So I'm not doing anything about a, an introduction. It's um, just a, a brief bit of prehistory. Uh, when World War One ended, HQRAF in France controlled 54 two-seater squadrons, employing just over a thousand pilots and a thousand observers. These weren't the totals, of course. These just those commanded by General Salmon. There would have been well over 3,000 observers in all. And by the time that the tap was turned off in February 1919, there were about 5,000 of them. But towards the end of 1919, the famous Trenchard Memorandum was published, and that became the blueprint for the RAF of the 1920s. And it makes no reference at all to observers. And just in case anyone hadn't gotten the memo, a weekly order published in January 1920 made it quite clear that uh, in view of the decision that practically all officers remaining in the Royal Air Force are to learn to fly, all pilots may in future be employed in any capacity as crew of an aircraft, that is, as observers, gunners, photographers, whatever. And it is noted that no provision has been made for observers in the permanent Air Force. Instead, the RAF was going to make do with tradesmen who were to fly as part time air crew, responsible and at least notionally trained for gunnery, photography, and bomb aiming, but not navigation, which to be looked after by pilots. Now, after some 15 years of peace, the service eventually began to recognize the inadequacy of its navigational skills and began to take these a little more seriously. In 1933, it began to offer selected pilots a new 13-week staff nav course at Andover using, a little oddly, cloud amphibians. At much the same time, it was also beginning to question the effectiveness of its post-1918 aircrew manning policy. And to use the Air Ministry's own words, in 1934, it has become for some time clear that the present system of providing for observer duties in the Royal Air Force by the employment of airmen as air gunners, mainly on a part-time basis, has been becoming increasingly inadequate. To address this situation, it was decided to reinvent the wheel and introduce a new trade, that of the Air Observer. This involved a great deal of staff work to identify the trades from which observers would be drawn, to define the length and nature of the training that they were to be given, and to calculate the numbers that would be required. And when all the sums had been done, the answer was 453. So the introduction of the new trade was announced in August 1934. It's intended that they should all be relatively experienced, having already completed seven years man, as distinct from boy service, so they were all supposed to be at least 25 years old. One third of them were expected to be ex-apprentices, the balance being drawn from trade supported by the new boy entrance scheme, which was also being introduced in 1934. But apprentices and boy entrance were admitted at 16, so it would be nine years before any of them would be 25 and thus eligible for selection as observers, that is to say, 1943. So until then, much of the intake would actually have to be drawn from serving ex-apprentices who joined back in the 1920s and airmen who enlisted as skilled adults directly from civilian life. Now those airmen selected were to spend two months at the Air Armament School at East Church. And the first course began in October, 1934, so the first qualified observers will have begun to join the squadrons at the beginning of 1935. Now, these second generation air observers were to be ranked as corporals, which was something, but they were still only part timers, the rest of their time being devoted to their parent trades. Their training also left something to be desired because the Air Armament School at East Church provided formal instruction only in gunnery and bombing. The increase in the numbers of observers passing through East Church had created accommodation problems which were initially alleviated by setting up what amounted to an annex school at Lucas, but it was still primarily an armament school. Other role-related issues like photography, signalling and general airmanship would be provided under unit arrangements once an observer had been posted to a squadron. The arrangements were revised in 1936 when training was concentrated at North Coates, allowing the establish following the establishment there of a dedicated air observer's school. With the increased attention that had been paid to providing 
trainee pilots with more instruction in navigation since 1933 had not produced any notable improvement in performance. So why? Well, basically, as Arthur Harris pointed out, because of the RAF practice of attempting to make pilots masters of all trades so that they never have time to become masters of their own. And a lot of them weren't that interested in navigation anyway. Furthermore, the problem was exacerbated during the 1930s by the increased attention being paid to cloud flying, something that wasn't really done at all in the 1920s. Now, since flying on instruments required a pilot's total concentration, this precluded his trying his hand at dead reckoning, even if he had wanted to. So an obvious solution to this problem would be to make greater use of the observer. By late 1936, opinion was becoming increasingly polarized between those who advocated giving the observer responsibility for navigation and those who were most reluctant to concede any element of the pilot's authority, especially not to a part-time corporal. They were right, of course, because the newfangled, inadequately trained part-time corporal observer simply wasn't up to the job. In 1937, it was decided that it, as an interim measure to beef up the system by adding three pilots qualified to staff nav standard via the Air Navigation School course by now at Manston to the establishment of all bomber squadrons. Bearing in mind that heavy bombers, Haifords and Harrows and the like, were crewed by two pilots, one of whom acted as the observer. But a two pilot solution could not sensibly be applied to aeroplanes like Heinz or the forthcoming Battles and Blenheims that lacked provision for dual control and or the ability to switch seats in order for the drivers to take turns. So like it or not, the service would have to rely on observers for these aeroplanes. And this meant that observers who until now have been formally trained only in gunnery and bomb aiming would now have to be given instruction in navigation to the same standard as pilots. So a four-week navi navigation phase was added to the syllabus at North Coast, extending the overall duration of the course to 12 weeks. At much the same time, this is February 1937, it was pointed out that if observers were now to become navigators, they lacked the status that really ought to be associated with that considerable responsibility. Air Commodore Douglas Evel, Sasso at Bomber Command, recommended that observers should be eligible for promotion to sergeant after a relatively brief period of squadron service, that their pay should be comparable to that of airmen pilots, that they should be entitled to wear the badge worn by the observers of World War I, and that in view of the demands that we made on their time on the ground as well as in the air, observers should be employed as full-time aircrew. Now, all of these things would come to pass eventually, beginning in October 1937 with the reinstatement of the old Flying O badge. Expansion Scheme F, which was supposed to be complete by 1939, required 1,200 trained observers, almost three times the 450 that had been envisaged only three years earlier. But the output from North Coast was only 200 per year, so it would still be well into 1942 before the new target could actually be met. Furthermore, there was a growing sense of unease over the viability of the concept of the part-time aviator. The relatively simple airframe systems and devices that the Air Force was accustomed to were being replaced by increasingly complicated aeroplanes which required new servicing techniques and a good deal more maintenance than in the past. It followed that since the part-time airmen could not actually be in two places at once, an increasingly difficult peacetime situation would become quite unworkable in the event of war. Now, having effectively, or perhaps ineffectively, been getting two men for the price of one for almost 20 years, the RAF was finally being forced to come to terms with the fundamental lack of realism which had underpinned its post-war aircrew policy. Now, reverting to the still ongoing who should handle navigation debate, some quite influential officers were beginning to question the wisdom of devoting so much effort to training pilots in navigation. They argued that the observer represented an underexploited resource and that a better solution would be to make him responsible for navigation. This case was presented at a policy meeting in May 1938 when it was eventually agreed that the navigation of the aircraft in war should be carried out 
by a properly trained observer navigator. That meant that an observer would now have to be added to the crews of aircraft that didn't already have one, that is to say heavy bombers and maritime aircraft, and it also meant that all observers would now have to be taught the new 10, soon to be increased to 12-week navigation syllabus that had recently been introduced for pilots. In effect, what had until then been the staff nav course, attended only by selected postgraduate pilots, was now to be the entry standard for all pilots, and now observers. By 1938, the manpower targets were being set by Scheme L, which would require more than 2,000 observers. Now, since it would be impractical to persist in trying to find the ever-increasing numbers required from within the service, it was decided to introduce direct recruiting of civilians with the aim of completely satisfying the demand for observers by 1940. There was a snag here because the civilian intake would have no other skills and there was no time to provide them with any. They would therefore have to be employed as full-time aircrew while internal recruits would continue to be part-timers. Nevertheless, despite their limited utility and their general lack of experience, the civilian recruits, like their service counterparts, were going to fly as corporals, in their case, instant corporals. To provide the additional numbers, four and eventually ten civil air navigation schools were contracted to provide the direct entrance with their 12-week instruction in navigation. The first courses began in August 1938. Now this is just the core of the syllabus. The 170 hours is only five weeks of a 12-week course, so it makes no allowance for all the other stuff briefing, planning, debriefing flights, desktop plotting exercises, visits, organized games and PT, bound to be PT, admin and all the other inevitable nifnaf. On completion of this civilian run phase, the direct entrance trainees reported to one of the two RAF depots at Bridge or Cardington for a fortnight military induction during which they were issued with their uniform. From there, they proceeded to a service run air observer school, where now working alongside internal recruits, they were given three weeks instruction in bombing, another three in gunnery, and a further six weeks of navigation training. And the first direct entrants were expected to reach the squadron as corporal in February 1939. Meanwhile, back in the previous October, Air Marshal Mitchell had written that the assumption that lay behind the previous policy that the observer need not be of the same high standard as the pilot should be finally abandoned, and it is clear that the observer is of at least equal importance, and it is accordingly proposed that both as regards pay and status he should be placed on an equal footing with the airman pilot. In conclusion, Mitchell even went so far as to advocate the creation of a class of commissioned observers. But during the remaining months of peace, the training system expanded significantly so that by September 1939, it looked like this. And by that time, while there was still a shortfall in overall numbers, the system was notionally capable of producing more than 2,500 observers a year. Before this, however, it had been pointed out that although the, the RAF had accepted that observers would be responsible for navigation in war, this did not cover peacetime. Now, as a result, it was devoting three months to training to what had until recently been postgraduate staff nav standard, each of three men to act as navigators in every large aeroplane, two pilots and an observer, and both men in a two-seater. It was argued that if observers were made responsible for navigation at all times, we could stop training pilots to do it. Despite its obvious logic, this proposal was to be bitterly opposed by Sir Edgar Ludlow Hewitt at Bomber Command, who insisted that the observer is the servant of the captain of the aircraft and that the ministry should never state that he is responsible for navigation, because if that were said, the captain would wash his hands of navigation. So those are Ludlow Hewitt's underlinings, incidentally, not mine. 
Now, it could be argued, of course, that the reason that navigation was in such an unsatisfactory state was precisely because captains had actually been washing their hands of navigation for 20 years. But the CNC was so cross that no one appears to have had the balls to point that out. Nevertheless, despite Ludlow Hewitt's spirited defense of pirates' rights, the fact was that, as Sir Arthur Harris had pointed out only a few months before, the general attitude in the service towards navigation is deplorable and the standard is lamentable. Despite Ludlow Hewitt's objections, in May 1939, it was finally ruled that observers would be responsible, albeit under the direction of the captain, for aircraft navigation in both war and peace, permitting the navigation content of the pirate course to be reduced from 12 weeks to just four, a not insignificant two-month saving. Meanwhile, back in 1938, Ludlow Hewitt had recognized that the rapidly increasing complexity and performance of each generation of bombers meant that if they were to be operated effectively, they were going to need permanently constituted crews. Working from this premise, he submitted a proposal that would form the basis of a new aircrew scheme that was actually introduced in January 1939. Now, this contained the crucial statement that employment as a member of an aircraft crew will in future be regarded as full-time employment and airmen for such duties will be provided additionally to the tradesman establishment of all units concerned. Now it was intended that in the fullness of time all of this new generation of air crew would be internally recruited from boy entrant wireless operators. Categorized as wireless operators air crew, in effect as dual capable WAP AGs, they would fly as aircraftmen for an initial period of three years from the age of 18. Most could then expect to continue to be employed as gunners, but about 25% would be selected to attend a 16-week course of navigation and bombing before being remustered as air observers, at which point they would have become sergeants. Following a further period of productive service, those observers who were considered suitable might ultimately become pilots. But the scheme also allowed for a proportion of observers and gunners to be commissioned, although there were at the time no indications as to when this might occur or of the numbers that might be required. So in the meantime, because there was still a shortfall in the numbers required to complete the expansion scheme, the recently introduced direct recruiting of civilians was to be sustained as a temporary measure just until the build-up was complete. Now, since the first August 1938 intake of direct entrant observers didn't complete their training until the spring of 1939, none of them ever became corporals, as had been the original intention. They actually materialized as instant sergeants, because under the January 39 scheme, all qualified observers were automatically sergeants. Furthermore, another clause within the scheme provided for all serving personnel who were already qualified as observers to be made up the sergeant as well. Because under the new scheme, apart from becoming full-timers, all observers were automatically sergeants. So every sergeant's mess from Scampton to Salita was suddenly obliged to give house room to dozens of jumped-up corporals, like John Bowie. A lot of 30-year-old ground crew took a pretty dim view of this invasion as it had taken them 12 or more years to, to acquire their three strikes. Now you'll recall that despite Ludlow Hewitt's reservations, in May 1939, the observer had been given responsibility for navigation. And to rub it in, most of them were instant sergeants with less than a year's service. The CNC was not a happy bunny, and he fired off a letter to AMP, Portal, in which he fulminated that the rank which they hold has, been, has proved extremely embarrassing. They are, of course, unable to exercise proper authority, and it is ridiculous that they should be given a rank for which they are unsuited. That the aircrew scheme that he had proposed had been torpedoed and doomed to failure by the introduction of these counterfeit NCOs, these half-baked sergeant observers. Now, as it happens, Ludlow Hewitt's January 1939 aircrew scheme was immediately eclipsed by the outbreak of war, because what had suddenly become an insatiable demand for observers simply could not be satisfied 
if they all had to spend an initial three years as wireless operators air crew. And in any, furthermore, it was soon considered unacceptable for mere aircraftmen to be flying on operations. With effect from May 1940, therefore, all WAP AGs and straight air gunners became temporary sergeants. And in any case, internal recruiting had been suspended on the outbreak of war, which meant that the construct that had been created as recently as January 39 promptly fell apart. From September onwards, the vast majority of wartime observers were civilian direct entrants into the RAFVR. The graduates of the early wartime system were graded as acting sergeants, acting observers. They could wear their three stripes, but without a flying badge until they'd done, perhaps I should say survived, six months on a quadrant. And since until then, they were not regarded as being fully qualified, they were paid only nine shillings a day, the rate for the pre-war part-time corporal observer. None of these constraints were imposed upon airmen pilots, of course, and it was October 1940 before the last of these inequalities, one might even say indignities, had been ironed out. From then on, observers emerged from training, just as they had done back in the summer of 1918, on exactly the same terms as pilots, that is to say, wearing their badges and ranked as temporary, not acting, sergeants, drawing the full 12 and 6 months per day. Now, you'll recall that the January 39 scheme had included a rather vague reference to commissions for observers. In December of 39, ACAS, Shelter Douglas, drew attention to the fact that three months into the war, there were still no commissioned observers and there was a desperate need for some in order to enhance their status because the prestige of pilots has been so extensively fostered in the past that there's been a tendency to belittle the importance of other members of the crew. And in the specific context of navigation, that some pilots have not shown themselves to be very keen to become expert navigators. Clearly, there was a pressing case for some observers to be commissioned because if any progress was going to be made, their voices needed to be heard. There ensued a round of arm wrestling with the Treasury over numbers, but in the end, the Air Ministry won, and it was agreed that up to 50% of observers could be officers which was the same proportion as the pilot, a measure of equality at least. Now, arrangements for the commissioning of observers were finally announced in April 1940, and they first appeared in the June edition of the Air Force list, and it contained 42 names. So while the navigating, bomb-aiming observer of Bomber Command represented the archetype, a need for specialization soon began to become apparent. But this first manifested itself in fighter command following the introduction of AI radar. By the end of 1940, radar was becoming a standard piece of equipment, so it was necessary to make more formal arrangements for the people who were handling it. So the new aircrew category of the radio operator air was introduced in January 1941. Now, some of these men were ground tradesmen, like electricians, wireless mechanics, or operators. Some were directly recruited. But many of the first cohort were air gunners who were being rendered redundant by the rolling re-equipment program, which saw three-man Blenheims being replaced by two-seat bow fighters. Wireless operators air gunner, who wished to stay with their squadron and were prepared to take on the challenge of the new equipment, were remustered as radio operators air gunner and retained their AG flying badges. But wireless operators who were not gunners did not have an appropriate air crew emblem. So an RO badge was introduced in May 1941. Only six weeks later, the category was rechristened to become the Observer Radio, OR, but the badge stayed as RO. At much the same time, Coastal Command was facing a similar issue. Its strike squadrons that had originally flown three-man Blenheims, but in the spring of 1941, these two were being superseded by two-man bow fighters. Now, in fighter command, it had been WAP AGs rather than observers who had been retained as radar operators. The opposite occurred in coastal command, where long-range operations over the sea dictated the retention of the skills of a professional navigator. By the summer, it was apparent that this had left a serious gap in capability because effective long-range communications over the sea implied the use of Morse at at least 20 words per minute. 
But since an observer's and a pilot's ability to read, never mind send morphs, speak with only eight words per minute during training, neither pilots nor observers were capable of handling this task adequately. The solution was to train selected observers as wireless operators to create the subspecialization of the observer WT, who continued to wear his standard flying O. Well, I'm sure that you are all more than familiar with the evolutionary wartime changes that began to transform the art of navigation into a science, so I'm not going to dwell on the introduction of distant reading compasses, the Mark 9 sextant, the air position indicator, G, and so on. Suffice to say, but by 1942, the impact of this sort of kit, along with growing numbers of four-engine heavy bombers, made it necessary to reconsider the constitution of bomber crews. Now, this had a knock-on effect across the whole range of aircrew categories. So far as the all-singing, all-dancing observer was concerned, his burden had begun to be lightened in May 1942, when the specialist trade of the air bomber had been introduced. The transformation was complete in July, when the Observer and his spin-off colleagues, the Observer Radio and the Observer WT, were all declared redundant when they were replaced by five subcategories of Navigator. In September, the old Flying O badge and the short-lived RO were both declared obsolete and replaced by the N and B badges. Now, a few words about training. The sequence for the wartime observer navigator went through a rather bewildering evolutionary process, complicated by the fact that the whole business was gradually exported. I could spend an hour expanding on this aspect alone, but for now it can be boiled down to this. For the first few months of the war, one entered via a receiving wing and passed through an initial training wing before attending pretty much the pre-war civil air navigation school and air observer school sequences. By 1940, the course of what had become an Air Observers Navigation School, in effect the pre-war civil schools now wearing uniform, had grown from 12 weeks to 16. Now, this is a summary of the syllabus, now spelled out in much more detail. Now, this was followed by eight weeks of bombs and bullets at a bombing and gunnery school, which included another 30 hours of flight time. By 1941, this two-phase approach had, become aban had been abandoned in favor of a combined 18-week syllabus at the Air Observer School. And by this time, the syllabus reflected everything, including PT. 689 hours is 18 38-hour weeks. Now, the syllabus content continued to be revised and refined, as these two tables suggest. But by 1942, most folks were being trained abroad. About 50% of the overall wartime total in Canada and another 25% in South Africa. By that time, 1942, the evolutionary process was pretty much complete, and for the rest of the war, there was a four-phase sequence. Stage one aimed to set a common entry standard, mostly via the Air Training Corps or a university air squadron, but where necessary, a stint with the aircrew training wing at Brighton or the preliminary aircrew training scheme, the PACT scheme, to brush up on basics like maths and physics. By late 1943, there were more than 20 packed centers and a variety of polytechnics and technical schools offering up to six months of pre-ITW training. Stage two involved formal classroom instruction at an initial training wing or a university air squadron. And stage three, still ground-based, but involved handling real kit and the use of synthetic trainers. Stages one to three, were all in the UK. Finally, stage four, almost entirely overseas, introduced air work, which could involve up to 130 hours of flight time. Now, I should stress that all of the glimpses of the syllabus that I've provided are snapshots of a constantly evolving system. It did become increasingly stable from 1942 onwards, but it was always subject to changes in detail or emphasis. Looked at in perspective, by the later years of the war, the sequence looked like this. Entry was via a couple of weeks at an aircrew receiving centre, mostly St John's Wood in London, before ITW and a few hours of grading flying to weed out anyone whose hand and eye coordination made them no hopers as potential pilots. 
followed by a four-week academic course at the Elementary Air Observer School at Eastbourne, later Bridge North, and an indefinite period in limbo with the Aircrew Dispatch Centre at Heaton Park awaiting embarkation, and that could be almost as long as a year. Now, once you got to Canada, depending upon one's category, NAV, Air Bomber, or the dual-capable NAV-B, one attended some or all of a navigation course at an Air Observer School, a weapons phase at a bombing and gunnery school, and four weeks of astro at an air navigation school. Then it was back to the UK for acclimatization at one of the observer's advanced flying units. The observer of 1939 took a notional 34 weeks to train, by which time he would have flown about 60 hours before he embarked on what passed for an operational conversion course. A late wartime nav would have logged two or three times as many pre-OTU hours in the course of about 50 weeks of training, although allowing for backlogs in the system that could well have taken more than two years. How many NAVs were there? Well, lumping observers, navigators and air bombers together, 49,000 were trained for the wartime RAF, most of them abroad under the Empire Air Training Scheme, and another 30,000 were trained for other Commonwealth Air Forces, and substantial numbers of these men actually flew with RAF units or in national units under RAF command, so the grand total was well over 80,000. And that takes us up to 1945, and here end the lessons.